Revelations. Easy? I think it is. <laughs> oh. I think back to uh, Brother Thomas found the truth and he probably looked at Revelation and he says, whoa, <laughs> what is that saying? And can you imagine him starting the exposition of Revelation? Where would he start? I suppose you do the same thing that Brother Dave did this, this morning, is just start at the beginning and start going through each verse and, and determining. But can you imagine the work that he would have had to put in to understanding Revelation? Let me ask you, though, in the books of Eureka, in five books of Eureka, is it really simple? There's probably some parts in there that make it easier to understand and whatnot, but there's words in there I don't know. And you know, you look at the young people and those who are coming to the knowledge of the truth, and we say, well, just pick up Eureka and read it, and it will explain to you the book of Revelation. Well, dear brothers and sisters and young people, Brother Sid asked me to do this talk, and something in me said yes quite quickly. Well, we teach everybody to think before speaking. I now learned why, and I guess from now on I'll have to practice this. But today, it has asked us to look at the six ecclesias that are mentioned in Revelation 2 and 3. And we'll leave the seventh for Brother Ed. I don't know how you just got one, but <laughs> quite fortunate. <laughs> yeah, so you're told. I expect wonders. i got to tell you, this was a challenge. It was a challenge because I have always struggled with history. If someone came to me and said, what's your favorite subject in school? Well, I'm like everybody else. I love gym and I love recess. <clears throat> and if they said, what did you hate? It would have been history. You know, growing up in isolation, I can't use it as an excuse, but I am going to for today. <clears throat> we didn't really study Revelations at all. We didn't study anything from Eureka. And why I'm standing before you trying to explain something I never really got into is beyond me. So my goal that was given from Sid, Brother Sid, is to put these six ecclesias on a level where the young people can understand it. So that is my challenge for today. And i got to tell you that this talk was probably the hardest talk that I've ever had to put together. Ever. I'm not looking for accolades because really at the end of it you'll probably know why. But I want to ask a few questions to start out with. And I'm hoping the answers will come from the youth to start with. Austin, Riley, my two Sunday school boys. <laughs> Chris and Jeremy. Anyone else who can answer? Jesse? I want to begin with asking a few questions. Ed, can either any one of you list all seven ecclesias without looking at your Bible? <laughs> it's tough, isn't it? Can anybody in this room list the seven ecclesias? Just put your hand up if you can. Wow. Okay. I'm feeling a little bit better. <laughs> okay, so that of the one of the two hands that went up, do you know the order in which they were given? I'll give you the first one, Ephesus. Anybody? Hands up? Oh, you're looking. <laughs> yeah. It's tough, isn't it? Okay. Out of those seven ecclesias, there were some that were condemned, and there were others that not condemned. Do you know how many were not condemned at all out of the seven ecclesias, Dave? One, Sid? One? One? Everybody agree with one? Oh, I got a two over here. 
So we've got one or two of these. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Two is the correct answer, by the way. If I could use uh, Jeremy and Chris again for handouts. I do have a handout here, and I want to uh, start with this handout. And uh, we're going to try and find these equations. Excuse my throat is a little bit scratchy after singing practice, and, and I also have the frog <laughs> problem. I'd like to thank Brother Dave and Brother Terry for their words. Um, Brother Kelly and I were talking afterwards and saying how that uh, Brother Dave's uh, words of exhortation, in a sense, his talk, placed us in an uh, overview of Revelation. Brother Terry narrowed it down as to the structure and where it was headed with the three frog spirit. And when we look through the revelations, it really comes down for the revelation to uh, John. It, a lot of it comes down to that three frog spirit and how does it affect us today. And so when we look today at the six ecclesias, we're going to look at, at the six ecclesias and how they affect us today. Does everybody have a copy? I, I only printed 38, I think, because the machine messed up on a couple. So, Everybody got one? We're all good? Oh, excellent. Oh, sorry. I wasn't supposed to go as a handout. Okay, so let's start. In front of you, you have a, a map. And what I want you to do is, if you've got a pen, just to write down the location of these ecclesias as they were spoken of in the chapters of Revelation. We obviously know that uh, it's not a huge point of uh, issue here if we know where the places are. I mean, it's not going to keep you out of the kingdom. But I found it as a note of interest because they were given in a particular order. And so it basically comes to that it's an interesting point. I know when I did my trip to Israel, it made reading the Bible totally different. So I'm hoping that kind of just knowing where these ecclesias are is when we hit uh, the letter to the Ephesians and, and so on and so forth, that you'll know kind of where they are. So on the overhead in front of you, um, we'll just kind of go through them. This is the order that they were spoken in, one, two, three, all the way down to seven. We are not going to deal with number seven, Ed, so have no fear at all. Uh, number seven. That is Laodicea. So, Dave, or I think it was Dave, showed where the uh, island of Patmos was, and that's where Paul or John received the vision. And so, what we want to do is kind of go through this. So, the first one, number one, I gave you was Ephesus. Um, I'm just going to kind of go through them here quick. If you want these afterwards, I can give them to you. I mean, it's like I said, it's not life or death, but it's kind of interesting to know. Number two is Smyrna, and these are, this is the order that we're going to talk about these equations as well. Number three was Pergamos, which is, I think, the one you were thinking of, Sherry. Number four was Thyatira. So he swung from three, Pergamos, made a swing around and started coming back south to Thyatira. Number four, five was Sardis. Number six is Philadelphia. And number seven was Laodicea. And that's the order that we will deal with them as well. So if you got a moment and you want to write them down, that's kind of where they're all located. If you want to write them down later, that's fine. We'll just uh, keep moving along here. It's not a, a long, long talk. So in relation to Israel... Oh, did somebody still working on them? Sorry. I heard that. <laughs> I've heard that before. You're too fast. Slow down. 
Okay, you're done. So, here's kind of where the uh, all the ecclesias were located in this area. And in relation to Israel in the red, uh, that's how far he traveled. And uh, makes you almost wonder why, you know, why didn't he just go into Arabia, Syria, Egypt, and, and in that area. But uh, there's particular reasons. So, And they are in the... Uh, in the book of Revelation, so we're going to deal with them that way. Uh, the setup for my talk. The setup for my talk is that I want to go through each of the ecclesias on a basic look, just to have a look at the, the towns and the cities and see what they were placed like, what was going on in the time. Nothing too deep. After that, I want to re go through them in their order and we'll look at it a little bit deeper and what the lesson applies to us today because after all that's really why we're here aren't we so we want to look at the first town is Ephesus and incidentally uh, each ecclesia received commendation counsel and a challenge there was condemnation but not for two but every one of them received commendation counsel and a challenge and we're going to uh, look at each of those as well in a little bit detail. So if we with that in mind, we want to look at Ephesus first. So Ephesus was of course nearest to uh, Patmos as we looked at the map. Uh, it was just basically off the coast and it's believed that it's John's own ecclesia was Ephesus. And it's thought by many writers when I was doing this study that the angel that was written to there is a possibility. It's a possibility. Just something to look at, maybe further study on, was Timothy. But here we have, and I'm going to put up pictures of ancient looking, uh, what's left of the place now today. Uh, I'm going to do three pictures for each of the ecclesias, and then uh, you just get, a, I want to get, form a mental picture first, and then we'll, we'll use that for later. So uh, Ephesus here, was the metropolis of Lydian Asia. And it was considered one of the best and the most glorious cities of those times. And it's today it's called by the Turks Ajazaluk. Or it means the Temple of the Moon. Well, the Temple of the Moon was uh, named from a structure that was built and dedicated to Diana, the goddess of the Ephesians. And as you see in front of you, it's an artist's rendition of this temple. And isn't it big and glorious when you look at it? How much time and effort they would have gone into. But think about it, because this is what the Ecclesia was facing at the time when they were trying to keep the truth. Um, the whole town now in Ephesus, well, there's really not much there anymore. It's just, uh, as you saw from the previous pictures, it's where people just dwell for raising animals and farmers and they live in dirt cottages they're uh, sheltered by the the wrecks and the ruins of the city but you look at it and you think of all this and all that pride and it's all gone everything's gone you know Paul introduced the truth to Ephesus um, I think believe it was in Acts chapter 18 and then uh Apollos. Remember how we always talk about Paul, uh, Paul and Apollos. They visited the city and he went there and proclaimed the doctrine of John the Baptist. Well, at the time that he established the truth, when Paul established the truth there, uh, he had made friends Aquila and Priscilla. And Aquila and Priscilla heard Apollos talking in the synagogue and they made friends with him. And they took him home and and it says in the scriptures that they expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. So they did a small adjustment on Apollos and set him right. <clears throat> and then uh, he went back out and taught about Jesus and that Jesus was the Christ. So he just had to tweak them a little bit and get him back online. So this is just a little information about the city itself. Uh, Paul later visited that city again and uh, the Ecclesia did grow. Uh, of course it had a lot of help from, from Paul. And uh, he called all the elders of the Ecclesia together and gave them kind of final words of exhortation before he left. Uh, he sent Timothy there because there was a problem in the Ecclesia. And so he sent Timothy to put things in order and stop those that were causing trouble. And uh, we have the letter written to the Ephesians 
uh, it kind of gives you a little bit of a, in, an idea of what he was talking about. So we know that in, Eph- in Eph- Ephesus, the truth flourished at one time. So just keep that in mind. So if we we just take this and narrow it down to, to Ephesus, the truth did flourish at one time. However, there was problems. We'll get into that later. If we look on your maps, the ones that hopefully you got it down if you didn't, it's 45 miles north of Ephesus. We came to Smyrna. Smyrna was also a very influential city. And it was really close to the islands out there in Asia Minor. Had a real nice harbor. And you know what happens when there's a harbor in any city. That brings in everything. It brings in everything from around the world. So again, the Ecclesia didn't have a, a real good run at doing what was right. They had, uh, had to fight to keep the truth. And really, there's no other mention of Smyrna in the New Testament other than here in Revelation, which is kind of interesting. And again, it was Paul stayed in uh, Ephesus for about three years since it's believed that he went up at this, this time and taught the truth in, uh, in uh, Smyrna. Uh, they were probably very healthy spiritually. Uh, Christ speaks of it in terms of commendation and encouragement. Uh, I'm not sure if you've ever heard of the, a gentleman by the name of Polycarp. He was martyred in about uh, 160, 167 AD. Well, it's uh, believed that he also associated with the Smyrna and Ecclesia. He was in the Ecclesia. But as things happen and time passes... Gradually, in Smyrna, the apostasy arose and the truth began to fade from view. But uh, at the point when Christ gave his message to the Ecclesia, it wasn't quite that way. So, again, we want to just give you a basic story about Smyrna and then we'll move on. So, just keep in mind that this group here, they had the truth. They were very good at the time that uh, the Ecclesia was given the message. But over time... The truth faded from view. The next city on the, the route was Pergamos. And really interesting about Pergamos, when I was looking up information on it, find Pergamos was really a kingdom as well as a city. So it, it was two things. It when, the, the kingdom actually is one of the four that came out of Alexander. Remember Alexander the Great? Out of his empire. And we read that out of them came forth a little horn in verse 9 of uh, Daniel chapter 8. So Pergamum was the one through which Rome came to power in the east. And if you go through history, you talk about Attalus, the king of Pergamos, and people like that. He was succeeded by his nephew, Philometer. I don't know how you say that correctly. I always wanted to say thermometer, but it's Philometer. And he really governed the kingdom in a real horrible manner. I mean, he wasn't barely on the throne. And, and he was killing his nearest relations. I think he was worried that somebody was going to come behind him and kill him and get him off the throne. He killed best friends, his family, those. I mean, he, he ruled very violently. Previous to his death, this guy made a will. And get this, he made the Roman people his heirs. Like, why would you will your country to someone else? I'll tell you what, he, this is what his will said. Let, all, let the Roman people inherit all my effects. Well, I'll tell you what, when Rome found out about that, it didn't take them long to come in there and pick up what they knew was theirs. Um, so he it compelled everybody there to submit to their power. So it, it didn't take very long for them to move into that area. Uh, Pergamos was the former capital of this kingdom. And there really isn't a whole lot written about Pergamos in the scriptures either, except for what we have here in Revelation. But uh, we know that it was headquarters of an apostasy that was developing. So we'll get to that uh, in the next little section here. So next we come to Thyatira. Well, Thyatira is an interesting ecclesia. <clears throat> the circumstance of this we find in Acts chapter 16, and you can read that at your leisure, so chapter 16, uh, verses 1 to 40. Do you remember the story about Lydia? And Paul at Philippi met Lydia. And Lydia was from Thyatira. And he started up a conversation with her about the truth. And uh, shortly afterwards, uh, she learned the truth and was baptized. 
Well, we know that if she was from Lydia, that she then took the gospel back with her to her hometown, to Thyatira. And uh, her and her household then would have formed the beginnings of that ecclesia, and they would have established it in that city. And then Paul would have visited uh, Ephesus. He made his rounds. Um, and so he would have given them a little bit more uh, strength and momentum as he as he would go around visiting. Um, and then uh, I have here the uh, just a minute, sorry. Ah, yes, he continued disputing in the school of one Tyrannus. We hear about him in the scriptures for two years. And so while he was there debating and uh, disputing with Tyrannus, well, it was in a sense teaching the word of, of uh, God to all those around for those, that two-year period. So there had to have been a lot of people from Thyatira there uh, listening to the word being taught. But the ecclesia among the Thyatirans became divided into two classes of leaders. Well, one class had love and service and faith and endurance in the days of John, and uh, the other class was characterized by idolatrous, showy, and murderous, like the wife of Ahab. And that's how it was referred to as the woman Jezebel. We'll get into this. Remember, Jezebel slew the prophets of Yahweh. She was quite nasty. And Kelly's been going through uh, the kings in his Wednesday night class, and we learn quite a bit when we study uh, Ahab and Jezebel. We've come across Ahaz and Hezekiah, and they're also found in these, in reference to these six ecclesias, which I found quite interesting. Uh, Thyatira was about 48 miles east of Pergamos, and today they know it as Akasar, Akasar, A K H I S A R, or it's called White Castle. There's a ruins there of a castle in that vicinity. And that's uh, just known today by its name. Instead of Pergamos, it's Akasar. Um, there's little of the ancient past in this modern city anymore. Um, it was noted for various trades. And you remember what Lydia did for her occupation. Lydia was a, uh, a dyer of material. Like In other words, she would dye. And that was a big trade in that city, in Thyatira. It was very famous for that. And also... They had many pagan religions uh, in that area, and it was uh, a problem for the uh, brethren and sisters in those ecclesias. And they found through excavations, uh, archaeologists are sort of suggesting that every skilled worker was a member of a union. I didn't know unions existed back then, but it says it was. And as such, they were expected to support the association they belonged to. Well, the tendency, therefore, would be to compromise religion to that end. And it's, uh, I'm just reading a quote here from a, another book. And it is this compromise that Christ condemns in his letter to the Ecclesia. The condition that he warns against might well have been brought about through these trade requirements. So it shows us how uh, careful we must be in uh, joining trade unions or anything like that. And I know it's one of the questions that gets asked on baptismal exams, so... So in uh, Thyatira, it was a very busy city, a very active city, and uh, it's much like the cities we have today. You know, I didn't show one picture of it as it was going. It kind of got tied up in Thyatira. Somebody just yelled at him, hey, where's the pictures? Okay, that's kind of a speed view of Thyatira. We'll say it was very small. So next we travel down to Sardis. Well, Sardis was once a very great and beautiful city. And it was uh, the renowned capital of Croesus. Rich, very rich. It was about 33 miles to the south of, south of Thyatira. And it was once known as the wealthiest city in the world. The wealthiest city in the world. Can you imagine that? Sardis. But today is what you're looking at in its finality. It shows the Acropolis built on a steep spur. Here it says uh, Mount Timaeus, about 800 feet above the plain of the city. Um, they had a lot of gold, and I think that's probably what made them so rich. It was in uh, a river there called the Pactolus River that flowed past the ancient city. I don't have a picture of the river, 
but they did get a lot of gold out of it. Um, in fact, Chris might be interested in this since we know he's a collector of coins. Sardis is famous for issuing the first gold and silver coins struck in ancient days. Did you know that, Chris? Do you have any? No. Let me see if I can buy one. Uh, they also had goddesses there, like Diana. This one was uh, they had. It was called Cybele. It was goddess of nature and fertility. And uh, so again, they struggled around there. But the city was ruined by an earthquake in uh, AD 17. The two cities were actually ruined. This one here, Sardis, and Philadelphia, because it was so close. But what happened in uh, in Sardis was the emperor turned over the money that they had collected for taxes, and they rebuilt the city. It never really regained what it, it was like before. It never became as rich as it used to be. But um, they did rebuild the city. Um, so again, you know, when we look at the message that God, uh, that Christ actually gave to the, the city was uh, quite appropriate to the rebuilding of the city. We'll get into that and we'll really get into it right now. But So today, uh, Sardis is now known as Sart, S-A-R-T. That's what the Turks call Sardis today. It's a little bit of distance from the ancient city, not very far. But it's not a, a magnificent city anymore. It's just a village. So the last one we come to is Philadelphia, before we move on. Philadelphia is commended. The city stood about 27 miles to the southeast of Sardis. And again, in AD 17, it was destroyed by that earthquake. And it was rebuilt, and it still flourishes today. Uh, I'll just read another quote I have here. Not much of the ancient city is found in the city today. The area is volcanic in character, and so most ancient buildings have been destroyed. In contrast to the high likelihood of earthquake and destruction, the conquerors in Philadelphia were promised an abiding place in the temple of God that will never be destroyed. Well, it was founded by Atene II, who was given the name Philadelphus because he had great loyalty to his elder brother, Eumenus, and he was a king of Lydia, and that's uh, very significant. It teaches us that believers should manifest loving loyalty to the elder brother, and it would be also the reason why this man's name uh, got changed to Philadelphus to Philadelphia, which uh, means brotherly love. Today, Philadelphia is called Ella Shahir. Ella, what does that remember? Remind you of if somebody said Ella. Allah. God, yeah. So that means, Allah Shahir means the city of God. So we learned some other interesting facts about these ecclesias, which you can follow up on and study on your own. I'm just going to bring them up to show you that there is another layer to this, which scripture shows itself to be infallible. Um, so when I rip through these slides, don't be angry. I got them all here for you if you want the information from them, but I just wanted to show you other information that I found about these uh, six ecclesias before we get into their relationship to us today. So, for example, each letter to the ecclesia is related to Matthew 13 and the parables that are throughout Matthew 13. So, he says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the ecclesias. Well, there's a complete set of seven parables and they follow a chronological order. For example, we have the seed and the tares. There's warnings to the disciples to expect disappointments. That's what he's talking to them about. And it was appropriate to the days when the message being preached widely, and it was being preached widely, widely, but then it was adulterated. So the first two uh, parables told there, the seed and the tares, relate to Ephesus the sower and Smyrna the tares, or the false Jews. This is the relation that I found. There's more to it. There's so much more to it. I can't get into it like Dave did. He's, he did a very thorough job. So we're just going to skim. The, sec, uh, the third uh, parable that he talked about was the mustard seed. The church became powerful and, and very materialistic. Well, this was related to Pergamos. The leaven, the corruption invading the, the ecclesia. Well, that would relate to Thyatira. Um, then we had... The hidden treasure and the pearl, the gospel of truth, is looked for, stumbled upon, found by accident, 
and so on and so forth. That would be to Sardis and Philadelphia. And the last one, of course, was the net or final judgment. When we look in Matthew 13 as the parable, and that would leave us with then Laodicea, which is the dragon. So, that's the one the one layer. The second layer I want to just bring out to you before we move on is that the letters to the Ecclesias introduce the major characters in this uh, prophecy. So, uh, like Brother Dave and Brother Terry went through, these six Ecclesias that are lined up in the first two, uh, the, well, chapter 2 and uh, chapter 3 of Revelation, now each one uh, that he talks about in each of the seven are followed through in Revelation somewhere else. So he sets it up in the first six Ecclesias, and then you can find these like Satan, and that old serpent called the devil, the false prophet, the Balaam, the great whore, Jezebel, the Nicolaitans, liars, with those who love lies, false prophets. Those types of things are all found. And you can go through, after we go through the, the six uh, Ecclesias, and Brother Ed's tomorrow on the seventh, and you'll find these running throughout uh, Revelation. So... It's like Dave showing that telescope. As you talk about here, but you'll talk about it later and later and later. So, we're even right to uh, Revelation 22. Okay. Um, the other thing you want to take note of, and we're not going to get into it either, uh, it's such a big study, was the names of Jesus spoken of in each of the introductions to the Ecclesias. For example, like this, And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first, the last, which was dead and is alive. That would be a name of Christ. Remember we were talking about that earlier. These things set the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega. And that's spoken of pretty much through all the Ecclesias. So just something you want to pick up and take note of and do your own study on that one. <clears throat> okay. So we come to the next section here. <laughs> that's not Brother Terry on his bike either. <laughs> Be more leaning over, I think. <laughs> We're going to look at these particular ecclesias in a little bit different way, maybe than probably what you're used to in, in your studies. It's the way I found it. It's the way I found it to make sense to me. And we can relate it to uh, terms and lessons that reflect to our day. I want to look at it in a way where we can see individuals in an ecclesia as well as the whole ecclesia. And we want to look at the dangers that can creep in subtly or sometimes very openly that would take over our lives and, and in time rob us of the truth. And this is where I believe the rubber really hits the road in these letters. It's where it should affect each one of us, young and old, those who are studying the truth, those who have been in the truth for many years, those who are new in the truth. It's a time to sit up and pay attention to what the Lord Jesus Christ is trying to tell us and warn us about. If you turn your hearts and your brains off now, you will miss the warning signs and any helpful counsel that has been given here by the Lord Jesus Christ. If this section that we go through makes you feel uncomfortable, then give praise to Yahweh. For now is the time to change. You know, it's a very sobering thought to think that some of these ecclesias were quite active. And in fact, they were quite dedicated. They had a lot of zeal for the truth. But as we know, time went on. And sadly, the materialistic and the compromising of the truth led to each of their demise and ruin. The question is, can it happen today? Brother Reen said that the truth runs in 120-year cycles. And in 1968, it was nearing the end of that cycle. Well, here we are, another generation later, 40 years later. It seems as though we may be barely hanging on, doesn't it? We are losing our young people. And brethren and sisters in great numbers it makes me kind of think if one more generation is allowed to exist will our hall look like this will it will there be any to preach 
and to hold on to the truth. To hold on to the only important thing that has been given to mankind. Or will there be only darkness and ruins as we just witnessed by the picture of the former places in history? Do you find this sobering? Well, just take a moment and reflect. Brethren, sisters, and young people alike. As Brother Terry mentioned, we have a written letter in our hands. It's amazing. It's written to each of us individually. It is from Jesus himself. And in it he tells us in particular the section we want to look at of our weaknesses and our strengths, both ecclesially and individually. The question is, do you want to read it? Do I want to read it? Are you willing to take rebuke? Are you willing to accept counsel? Are you willing to change? Are we willing to give Yahweh our heart, our very center, that which moves us and at the same time can deceive us? That's really what he's asking from each of us, isn't he? He's asking it of us individually and from the ecclesial level. He wanted their whole heart. He wanted their trust. He wanted their faith. And he wanted their works. We start in Ephesus. And you know, each letter that we go through has a relationship to the Old Testament. I found that quite interesting. We find a reference to the Old Testament in each of these letters written to the Ecclesians. And sometimes there's quite a few references made back to the Old Testament which, with many lessons. But we want to start with Ephesus again. Let's go back to Ephesus. And you can write in your notes, if you like, what each Ecclesia was known for. For example, Ephesus was known as the hard Ecclesia. And we find their reference to the Old Testament in the Garden of Eden. Interesting. He uses the, the phrase, the tree of life in the midst of paradise. He goes right back to the beginning with the beginning Ecclesia. Here in this Ecclesia, there was a lack of first love. And Christ's warning should remind believers in every age including our age here, that it is impossible, impossible to be involved, or that it is possible to be involved in the tiring work of Christ for Christ's sake. But we can be doing this without being motivated by the love for Him which He desires to see above all else. Do you know the kind of people that do this? Are we one of them? Have you ever heard this? Those people do so many good deeds. Why won't they be saved? Well, the scriptures say faith and works must work together. One without the other is dead. And this is where the ecclesia was at. Work can be done for his sake. Or in order to preach the gospel, even after the first love has been lost. I do it because I have to. You know, I have an example of that. When I was young, and it was probably, it was definitely before I was baptized, but it came time to do the readings. We were in the middle of ping pong. I was probably about Jeremy and Chris's age, or ping pong, or hockey, or wherever we were playing down in the basement, and that call came to do the readings. I don't know if any of you can kind of line up with that, but it was pretty tough being a young person. Now that I'm a little bit older, I find that it's very important because it's easy to lose maybe it's just because I'm older I don't know but their heart in this ecclesia was not given over to full service and a loveless attitude of works without faith was manifested and we see that in the Pharisees weren't they the message to this ecclesia in Ephesus warns that it is possible that it is possible to display zeal display zeal for a purity of the doctrine 
the truth. We can, we can display zeal for the proclamation of the gospel, to preach the gospel. But we can do it without being truly motivated by love of Christ, <clears throat> without a warm-hearted emotion towards Him. And despite this ecclesia's insistence for doctrinal purity, it had lost its first love. And victory would only be given to those who rediscovered that and showed it in action. And if they did this, they were told that he would give to them to eat of the tree of life. They struggled to maintain the truth and to live it at the same time. It is a tough thing. There's so many things out there that grab our attention. We can come here and look really good on Sunday. But, is it in our heart? Brother Thomas said in Eureka, to eat of the tree of life is to be granted life eternal. This was denied Adam and his posterity, but it will be permitted the seed of the second Adam. Thus the first and the last books of the Bible are joined, almost like a bridge. The former things, how it began, and the latter showing how they will end. Eden will be restored. The second Adam, or Jesus Christ, will be joined in marriage to the second Eve, or the Ecclesia, and they will be not united as one in the paradise of the deity. To eat of the tree of life is to be an unfading leaf, an immortal possessor of glory, honor, and incorruptibility of the kingdom which the God of heaven will set up in the age to come. End of quote. This ecclesia received commendation in verses 2, 3, and 6 of chapter 2. They received condemnation in verse 4. They received counsel in verse 5. And they received their challenge in verse 7. The next ecclesia we want to talk to is Smyrna. They were known as the persecuted ecclesia. It was said they were cast into prison. They were dead and they were alive. It kind of reminds us of the story of Joseph, doesn't it? It takes us back to the story of Joseph when he was cast into a pit by his brothers. And yet, after everything was over, in Genesis 45:28, Israel said, It is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go and see him before I die. It is interesting that here we have the title of Christ. He is the first and the last. The Alpha and the Omega. Ecclesia in Smyrna was persecuted. And he could relate to this Ecclesia because he too was persecuted. He too suffered, but he won through victory. Even though he suffered tribulation and blasphemy and poverty, and he was taken into custody like Joseph, he stayed faithful unto death. And he, today he is alive. So it is interesting that this Ecclesia is titled, They Were Dead and Yet They're Alive. They did suffer much tribulation, as will all who try to attain to the kingdom of God. The word signifies pressure. And the pressures of life are frequently designed of God to mold believers into shape. These stayed truth, stayed, sorry, these stayed true to the truth. The so-called Jews may have been sincere and reverent in their approach to God, but they were blasphemers. And because as such, those in Smyrna found them an embarrassment. Their inconsistent attitude possibly provided the civil authorities occasion to move against Christianity as a whole. Brethren and sisters and young people, we cannot profess to be a student of the Bible, a follower of Christ, and go out from this place here and not be recognized by any of your peers as religious or practice or we cannot go out and practice false religion, doing things that seem to be good in our eyes. We are to be consistent to our beliefs. Be strong and waver not. Think before you act or speak, and always ask, will this, what I am doing, 
give God the deserved glory he deserves. This ecclesia received commendation in verse 9. They received no condemnation. Commendation, verse 9, no condemnation. They received their counsel and their challenge in verse 11. So we move on to Pergamos. Pergamos was known as the fighting ecclesia. And it refers us back to the story of Balaam. I don't know if anybody remembers Balaam, but he allowed uh, riches and honor to blind him to the responsibilities to Yahweh. He compromised the truth for the sake of wealth. I don't know if you remember that he constantly sought permission to go to Balak and he said, if the men come to call, he rise up and go with them. And he didn't heed that condition. So he basically turned around to his own uh, case and he did not uh, answer the suggestions by the angel. He was rebuked by the ass and he just forgot about everything. So when he talks about the doctrine of Balaam, it is one who is prepared to bend scripture to personal advantage. We justify, usually for our gain. We've got to miss meeting for the job. I've got to miss study weekends for whatever reason, or gatherings, or Wednesday class. I've got to miss the readings. i got a ping pong game to attend. We miss family time to study because we've got other important things to, go, to attend to. We get into a position not to miss these important things. That is what we need to do. They bent the truth for personal advantage. And you notice the name here, if you're following along in the scriptures of Antipas. He said he's styled here my faithful witness. He represents all those who hold fast the name, all those who do not who deny not the faith of Christ in persecution. So Pergamos received their commendation in verse 13, their condemnation in verses 14 to 15, their counsel in verse 16, and their challenge in verse 17. Thyatira is known as the endangered ecclesia. Endangered because she of her, Jezebel. You remember the story of Jezebel? She knew the truth but decided to compromise it and twist it to fit her needs. The accusation brought against this eldership in Thyatira was just that. It tolerated, in fellowship, a group described as that woman Jezebel. Well, they thought they could contain this influence in the group in the midst of the ecclesia. They thought that they could fix the problem. And yet they found out that over time, Jezebel, in their ecclesia, grew to be known as Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. Jezebel was a very wicked person, the daughter of a king. His brother Kelly went through his study. They had very high standing. But she, did, she possessed ability, intellect, and willpower. She was an, an idolater. She was a dominating wife. She even stood up to Elijah the prophet. She introduced... She was introduced by Ahab in Israel and she was the one that caused many problems who put to death many good people. And she assumed a position of a prophetess or a teacher. They didn't change this. The Ecclesia allowed it. The community within the Ecclesia and Thyatira did the same things. It was active in setting forth its false doctrines. They undermined the truth. Jezebel was very incapable of remorse and fear. As we remember when she was approached by Jehu. She was out in the window, all dressed up. But boy, she suffered a terrible fate, didn't she? A terrible death. Flung from the window by those who previously liked her. She was speared by the soldiers of Jehu. She was trodden underfoot by horses, consumed by hungry dogs waiting for her flesh. They should have known this in Thyatira when he warned them. But they didn't. They did what they thought was right. There is no slacking off in work, but rather we must increase and develop in it. 
the Kalisha was commended for it. But unfortunately, they justified themselves by works rather than applying itself to the matters of great importance resulting in conditions that we just talked about. He says to them at the end, I put no other burden on you. Why would he say that? Well, the Lord would put on them no other burden than that which he had already stressed. He said the withdrawal from those errorists whom they had tolerated until that point of time. And withdrawal is a point, is a part of growing in the truth. It's the last act of love an ecclesia can do in order to bring around one who has error or wrong conduct. The warning from Jesus is that if you don't deal with the problem quickly, it infects the whole ecclesia. He does not say withdraw immediately or quickly, but begin the process and follow it through to its end, where you help to convert one back, or sadly have to withdraw. They receive their commendation in verse 19, their condemnation in verse 20, their counsel in verse 25, and their challenge was issued in verses 26 to 27. Sardis was known as the dead ecclesia. And yet there were a few. It reminds us of a few people in scriptures, doesn't it? It reminds us of Joshua or Noah where he says they would walk with me, they would not be blotted out. But here's what he said, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that you live, but you're dead. So in essence, they were held in high repute. Wow, look how good they are. <clears throat> but they were actually dead, spiritually dead. They promised much, but performed little. They had no air, but they had no warmth. Their heart was like a stone. He said, you are dead. Why were they dead? Well, they had indulgence of pleasure. They had a lack of prayer. And they had a lack of faithful testimony to the truth. Can you imagine being read out this in front of the ecclesia? Here's the things. You have an indulgence in pleasure. You lack prayer. And you lack faithful testimony to the truth. That would have been shocking. Can you imagine if we had someone come in here and tell us this? It would be tough to swallow the pride here. In the Numbers Expositor, it says, Ecclesias and ecclesial members can likewise give every external appearance of bearing fruit, but fail to do so. Sardis, it was recorded, Thou hast a name that thou livest and are dead. Attendance at the meetings, constant reading of the Bible, must be accompanied by a practical application of principles honoring to Yahweh. In the absence of such, an ecclesia or an individual appears to him in the same light as the woman mentioned in the verse. Indeed, the people of Israel in the days of Ezekiel were like that. For with their mouth they showed much love, but their heart went after their covetousness. Their actions aroused the jealous anger of Yahweh. Through Ezekiel he declared, I will judge thee as women that break wedlock and shed blood are judged. And I will give thee blood in fury and jealousy. They were held in high reputation before men, but they sure weren't in the sight of God. Do you ever think that standing for good causes many, uh, causes us to make us look good to men? It is just that. It looks good to men, but it makes us look bad to God. You know, standing up for Things like Pink Day. I don't know if you guys have it in school still, Pink Day. Or what about signing petitions? We give our opinions on world governments. We might wear a poppy. People say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, they may seem like small things, but what's the motivation? We can look good to mankind, but be nothing but a whited sepulcher, a good-looking grave. But inside, they're still just dead bones. The ecclesia seemed large and lively to others, but it was all fake. All it did was hide a corpse. The ecclesia was pronounced spiritually dead. Yet, he said, there are a few people, a remnant, that would be dressed in white, those like Noah. True saints, it says, are already clothed, their garments being pure and unstained, but they must be kept in that state, and in due time the nature will also be made white. 
We must remain watchful, as Brother Terry indicated this uh, this morning. And if you watch, if you look at the word through Scripture, we are exhorted to be watchful, because we know not the time of the Lord's coming. Because in order to guard against temptation, so as to recognize error, we must be watchful in prayer, be watchful in view of prophetic signs, be watchful to obtain a blessing, and to be watchful to receive the reward. If we do this, we will not be found spiritually dead. For by watching, we are encouraged to remain faithful to what has been preserved through the ages. And thus, they receive their commendation in verses 2 and 4, their condemnation in verses 1 and 2, their counsel in 2 and 3, and their challenge in verse 5. And so we come to the last equation. Philadelphia. Well, as we mentioned before, they were known as the Beloved Ecclesia. And they had a relation to the key of David in Isaiah 22, Eliakim, where it says they're open and shut, shut, open. we get to that. Christ is the door. And who can open the grave and the temple? And who can shut both of these but Christ? Philadelphia signifies brotherly love. And the message reveals it to have been a small ecclesia, but strong and full of zeal. A fighting ecclesia, opposed to the synagogue of Satan. An enduring ecclesia, manifesting faith in the face of tribulation. They had faith and works. And they did all this together, as a unit, being loyal to each other and their elder brother, Jesus Christ. As I mentioned before, Brother Kelly in his Wednesday class has been going through the kings, and in this we see open and shut and shut and open through the study of Ahaz. He closed the temple. He had shut up the temple, and yet through Hezekiah it was reopened again, and things were changed around. We had different movement of people, Eliakim replacing Uriah, and so on and so forth. And the key of David is spoken of. There is kingship and priesthood. The key of David indicates then authority in regard to the kingdom of David, which was and will be the kingdom of God. This teaches us that believers should manifest a loving loyalty to their elder brothers. What do we take from this ecclesia? They were not condemned, and yet they received counsel. Well, there's nothing to be feared from an earnest contention for the faith if confidence is placed in Christ. He possesses all authority in heaven and earth, can open the door for the preaching of the word in sometimes the most difficult circumstances. Many have been placed in odd situations and had the opportunity to preach the word. And these opportunities only come from Yahweh. We must never waste an opportunity to preach. In contrast to the Ecclesia in Sardis, this ecclesia here in Philadelphia was small in numbers, but they were active and vigorous in the attitude of each other. When presented with situations, they were never afraid of bringing in God's word. It says they never denied Christ. Philadelphia, the ecclesia of brotherly love. They were beloved of the elder brother. The whole world will one day be compelled to acknowledge Christ himself. What a wonderful testimony this ecclesia received. Toward the end, our Lord speaking to this ecclesia, his warning would have reminded the brethren in Philadelphia that the possibility always exists of having the crown of victory snatched from them if they elected to follow man rather than the word of God. So he did. He encouraged them to keep the faith. To keep demonstrating that faith through works. And in all this, the individuals in that ecclesia were to continue working together for the common goal. What an exhortation to us. What a great legacy to leave to those who come up behind us in the next generation. Work together. Keep the faith together. Fight for the truth together. Never compromise my word, he says. And in doing this, Yahweh promises... To him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God. Their commendation was in verses 8 to 10. 
They received no condemnation. Their counsel was in verse 11 and their challenge came to them in verse 12. I found in this short study of these six ecclesias that there is no time restriction of the ecclesias, but that they contain all the warning and counsel that is needed in all the time periods since Jesus left to be with his Father. These warnings are to the ecclesias as a whole, as well as to each of the individuals in that ecclesia. I handed you an outline of each of the seven ecclesias, and if you look at each one, not right now, but after, the warnings are very current, and they have been throughout the ages. We are not just in the Laodicean period. We are in the stages of each of the ecclesias and what they represent. Thus the conclusion we can draw is that he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the ecclesias. The ecclesias, all of them. He says to take heed, take warning, take counsel, and follow the challenges he presents to each of the ecclesias he writes to. <coughs> For don't forget, his letter is to each of us. The answers and directions have been given. Read the letter. Read the letter that has been written to you and to I and to our Ecclesia. We are left with a question to ponder. What would the letter written to the Richard Ecclesia or the Edmonton Ecclesia say? If Jesus was to write you a letter personally, what would it say? Search your hearts, honestly. Read these letters that we have in front of us, because in them they contain your letter, your personal letter, and strive to make a change, an honest change. And if we stay faithful, we have the promise that he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the ecclesias. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Let us strive to keep this picture on our minds as we await our Master.